the way. Um, and it's not a lecture, so feel free to stop me and ask questions along the way. I'm sure as we sort of start to open up conversation, there'll be heaps of questions that you want answered. Yeah, I think um, if we just make it as relatable to yeah. the, the women here. Uh, the lovely age bracket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, goes, Rebecca goes, this is... Uh, it's all women. <laughs> I'm like, um... <laughs> Like, did you expect the husbands to come? <laughs> so, yeah, I think um, we'll sort of go through this, uh, try and make it relevant to you, ask questions along the way as much as you can to make it even more relevant to you, and then we can um, open up even more. Cool? Yeah. Awesome. Ready to start? Yeah. Wonderful. Well... This is the wonderful team that I'm a part of. So I'm Rebecca, one of the dietitians or sports dietitians from Apple to Zucchini. So we work out of the Queensland Sports Medicine Clinic at the Gabba, like a 15 minute drive away from here. Um, and I see a broad range of clients. And look, I have been seeing more and more in that sort of perimenopause, postmenopause state. Um, and a lot of the myths that we'll talk about today, I think are directly applicable to someone who's going through that transition. Um, but as I said, please like ask some questions along the way and I'll make sure I've got some time at the end um, if anyone's got anything that they want to specifically talk about. Who's heard faster training burns more fat? Yeah, I'm surprised if you haven't. Like often it's a question that I get, like should I be eating before I exercise? Should I turn up faster? Which one's gonna get me the weight loss and the fat loss that I'm really after? So I wanna delve into that to start with. That's a good one, sorry, because you know, I've done a poll before for people that train in the morning. Yeah. And I just did it one morning. And out of like 50 people that train in the morning, I think one or two people had eaten something. Yeah. And it's really hard, right, when you're transitioning through perimenopause, there are definitely hormonal fluctuations that make it incredibly difficult to shift body composition and weight. I'm sure that that's a common frustration. Um, and this one, yeah, creeps up all the time. Like if I want to put in the effort with exercise, how am I going to get the best outcome? Should I be eating something beforehand or not? And I think we really need to define um, the difference between fat oxidation and fat loss. So fat oxidation relates to fat being used as a fuel source. So when we exercise, our body is going to use either predominantly fat as a fuel source, carbohydrates, and probably in most situations, a mixture or a combination of both. Um, whereas fat loss is relating to, I guess, the outcome that somebody would want. They want to be losing fat off their body. They're not the same thing. They are completely different. So fasted training, yes, absolutely greater fat oxidation. Your body is using more fat as a fuel source, but to lose weight or drop body fat, you still need to be eating less than what you're expending in a day in terms of energy. Um, so it doesn't necessarily translate to weight loss or fat loss. And it can just leave you feeling like you've had a crappy workout. Who's tried to really pull the intestines intensity with some of these sessions, waking up on an empty stomach after a poor night's sleep? Um, whereas if you topped up with a small source of carbohydrates, like a piece of fruit, for instance, on the way, generally you're able, you're able to push the intensity and get more out of that session. Um, and there was a study that was done in 2014 that I wanted to go through as a bit of an example. It's actually tested this hypothesis among women. Now, I don't know whether they were perimenopausal women specifically, but certainly 20 women. And they had all 20 performing three one hour cardio exercise sessions per week over four weeks. And they were all in uh, like an energy deficit. So consuming 2000 kilojoules less than what they were burning each day. We had 10 of that 20 women performing the exercise in a fasted state. And we had the other 10 performing the exercise after they consumed a thousand kilojoules in a, in a shake form or a liquid meal form. And guess what? no significant difference in weight loss or body composition changes between those two groups. Both groups lost roughly the same amount of weight. There was no statistical significance in terms of difference. Um, and I've got the, the study reference at the bottom if you wanted to go and have a look at um, that one in a little bit more detail. So I guess like faster training is not inherently better. Um, you can still lose weight, but you can lose just as much by having something to consume and the way you sort of distribute that energy across the day is probably less relevant. So false, it's, um, it doesn't necessarily burn more fat, but you expend or you're using fat as a fuel source more so. 
What about carbs causing weight gain? I know there's quite a bit of confusion in this space as well. They're typically the first sort of macronutrient that gets dropped um, when someone's looking to lose weight. Has anyone sort of tried to lower carbohydrate intake? Yeah. Have you been successful with that? Does anyone want to talk to their experience? Yeah, exactly right. And look, I guess I'm making an assumption here, but most people aren't interested in just weight loss. They're interested in losing it and maintaining it. So the best diet to be on or the best approach to take is something that you can actually sustain. And yeah, I've had clients who've been incredibly successful with low carb diets because naturally it's something that they gravitate towards and it's suitable for their body and they actually get great results. But I've got just as many women who are really struggling thinking they're doing the right thing and just to be so frustrated when they're not able to maintain results. So let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So I've got images there of foods that contain carbohydrates. So you've got some more nutritious options like fruit, whole grain bread, sweet potato, but you've also got carbohydrates that you find in the more ultra processed form like cookies, ice cream, all the delicious chips that we love to consume. Um, so there's carbohydrates in all of them, but they're gonna have a different impact on our body. So let's have a look at hot chips, for instance. So potato being a source of carbohydrate, You've got 100 grams of hot chips you might get at a fish and chip shop, about 1,300 kilojoules in that, about 35 grams of carbs and a fair amount of fat. Let's look at 100 grams of baked jacket potato. So it's still a high carbohydrate choice. Look at the kilojoule value. So to lose weight, generally we'll, we do need to be reducing our energy intake relative to expenditure. So it does ultimately come in to you know, come into play being less coming in, more being expended, and that concept of, of energy balance still will hold true. Um, if you're cutting out a massive lot of food, you're, it's going to facilitate an energy deficit, but I don't believe it's the carbohydrates that are the issue, it's the form in which they're in. Have a look at another example. So pasta, for instance, again, typically, um, someone would avoid this on a, on a low carb diet. You've got a carbonara with a cup of cooked spaghetti, 40 grams of carbs, but also 2,300 kilojoules in that particular portion. Contrast that with a spaghetti bolognese being a tomato-based sauce. It is a lot lower in fat, still same carbohydrate content, but significantly less kilojoules or energy. So is it the spaghetti or is it what's on the spaghetti? So in terms of this myth, they don't cause weight gain inherently, anything in excess and the form matters more in terms of its relationship with somebody's body weight changes. What about intermittent fasting? This one is quite topical. Like I probably don't go a week without having a conversation on intermittent fasting. And I know there's a lot coming up in the space of um, perimenopause and menopause and this being quite touted as a, a superior method in terms of balancing hormones and facilitating weight gain. Um, what have you heard about intermittent fasting? Good? Yeah. Bingo. You Google any, any intermittent fasting, you've got one article saying this, another saying something else. So you open Women's Day and you've got, you know, my success with intermittent fasting versus I need to eat regularly and that's the way I've sort of lost 20 kilos. So it's utterly confusing and what do you actually believe? Yeah. So let's unpack this a little bit more. I think we need to start opening the conversation around what is intermittent fasting? Because there's a variety of different methods and definitions that you'll see both in the literature and also in practice. So this first image here relates to what we call um, time-restricted eating. So essentially, as the name suggests, we restrict our intake to a certain predefined period of time. So the 16-8 method is one example where you'd fast for 16 hours overnight. So say between 8 p.m. and midday the next day and you'd only consume food within that eight hour window between um, midday and your 8 p.m. for dinner. You've then also got um, periods of intermittent energy restriction. So the 5-2 diet that came about several years ago now, you've probably seen that um, 
mm -hmm. the media to some extent. But this one here's a little bit different because you restrict your intake quite severely for two days a week and then you eat normally for the other five. So hence the two five. Um, and they're both completely valid methods of intermittent fasting. And to be honest, I've used both methods with clients for a variety of reasons. Um, and you know, you can be successful on this and you can't. So I like to think of intermittent fasting as simply a tool. Um, as I said, I've got clients that thrive on it because how much easier is it to count time rather than count energy content of food? And if it's creating that energy deficit because you're limited to consuming food within an eight hour period or you know, several days a week as opposed to every day, well, if it's creating that deficit, you are gonna be successful in losing weight. Um, I've had quite a few clients that struggle in the eating periods low. So they're so ravenously hungry from fasting on those set two days a week or the 16 hour overnight fast that they just consume more than what they would have if they just ate regular meals. So it's about, you know, for me as a dietitian, when I work with an in individual, it's a tool that may or may not be successful. It's something that I may or may not try for someone. In terms of impact on hormones, it's gonna change like your insulin concentration, which manages blood sugar, which may actually be detrimental as opposed to beneficial. It's, it shouldn't have an impact on your estrogen or sex hormone levels. I'm not aware of anything that's been published in terms of, you know, increasing your estrogen levels to manage you know, symptoms during perimenopause. Um, if you've come across that, I'd really be interested in having a look at that, um, but not to my knowledge. So if, you if you've been successful losing weight with intermittent fasting, you've simply created that energy deficit um, by eating in a shorter period of time. There was a 12 month randomized control trial um, that I wanted to look at in terms of just an example study. So this included both men and women. Um, and again, I'm not certain in terms of the age bracket, 77 obese um, individuals. So they had a fair bit of weight to lose and they split them into three different groups. So the first group um, did a form of time restricted eating. So they only ate within an eight hour window faster for 16 hours overnight. A, uh, and they weren't told to count calories or energy. It was just like you stop eating at 8 p.m. and you can eat again at midday the next day versus another group where they were actually prescribed a 25% reduction in their energy intake, so creating that energy deficit, but they could eat that whenever they wanted in the day. And then they just had a control group like you or I where we weren't doing anything. In terms of the outcome, as a quote from the study, intermittent fasting was more effective in producing weight loss than the control, but no more effective than the calorie restriction group. So it's more effective than, than doing absolutely nothing, but it's no better in terms of success with weight management in this study anyway, um, to just a 25% reduction in your energy intake and you can eat whenever you want. So nutrition is definitely a science, but it's about talking with that individual and working out what approach is gonna be successful for them. And it may or may not include intermittent fasting in some form. Um, so, I don't believe intermittent fasting is the best way to lose weight. You can lose weight on it, but it's certainly not superior to any other method. What about this one here? I have, haven't really heard this a lot from clients in terms of questions recently, but I used to have this conversation all the time around like frequency with meals. So, you, you know, eat small frequent meals. You've got to have six mini meals in a day because you're going to keep your metabolism firing. Let's unpack this one. So I think we need to open up the conversation with a discussion around what energy expenditure is. So as a total amount of energy that you expend in the day, the blue there stands for basal metabolic rate. So about 70% or more of the energy that our body expends in a day is just simply sitting there doing nothing. This is why if someone was in a coma in ICU, we have dietitians that prescribe um, tube feeds because they still expend energy lying there doing absolutely nothing. We then have exercise in yellow. So that's obviously a modifiable component. You, it would expend more if you've done more exercise, more classes here, more walking around. Um, and then NEAT stands for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So it's the energy of movement that's not planned exercise. So me walking from my car across the road to here would be NEAT activity, um, taking the stairs instead of the lift, for instance. And then the last sort of 10% of the energy that we expend is the thermic effect of food. So the energy that we expend in digestion. 
Um, and so I guess where this myth comes from is the thought that if we eat more frequently, we spend more energy in that thermic effect of food, so we're going to increase that up. It's only 10% to start with. And when we look at the literature, when total daily energy intake is equivalent, there's no difference in energy expenditure for those who have this drip feeding and grazing across the day of food compared to gorging on like two massive meals and no snacks. So again, we can use this to our advantage, right? Because some people like the idea of being able to eat frequently because I want to be able to eat every two hours, I get to enjoy something nice in my mouth. Um, but for others, like I've worked with clients where they just want to feel full after a meal. And if you've got this tiny amount of food coming in every two hours, you never actually feel full enough. So either approach can work, but it's not because you're expending more energy when you're eating frequently. Um, and what I find generally is the, the more frequent you eat, the greater the amount of energy intake anyway, because there's greater opportunity to be consuming more. Um, but again, if you're a person who can control your energy intake with smaller, more frequent stuff, then great, go for it as a strategy, but it's not because you're burning more energy. Yeah, um, so it is highly individualized. One of the biggest factors is gonna be your lean body mass or your muscle mass. Um, and that, like the more muscle you have, the more energy you burn at rest. So generally even, uh, and even greater fat mass as well. So if you had a 100 kilo person who had 20 kilos more fat than an 80 kilo person, they're gonna be expending more. Um, Cause it, uh, fat is still somewhat metabolically active. Um, and that's where sort of gender comes into play as well because generally men have more muscle mass than women. So it comes down to that lean body mass, more importantly. We can actually see our basal metabolic rate drop when we're too aggressive with our energy restriction as well. Um, so the body will shut down normal physiological function if you slash your energy intake in half. And we see that probably at about two to three weeks. Um, so this is why you might see some dietitians or some sort of nutrition experts where we put someone on more of an aggressive energy restriction for two weeks and then they go back to maintenance energy or diet break um, and then we put them through those cycles. So that's one way to do it and it's to try and avoid that reduction in basal metabolic rate or that adaptation. Um, you don't break your metabolism low, so if you're in a situation where you've been you have quite a, a lengthy history in terms of dieting. I'll hear a lot of the time, oh, my metabolism's broken. I did like such stupid stuff when I was 20 and 30. Now I can't shift the weight as a 45 year old woman. It's not broken. If it's adapted the other way, you can adapt it back. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So um, if someone is, let's say, they feel like they've got fat to lose. Yeah. Um, but they accurately, eat very low calorie and they have for a long time, do you think that's just a, a metabolism that has adjusted to that? Or do you think it's under reporting? Or? Um, yeah, look, you said, when you said, oh, they're accurately reporting, that's yeah. probably what I question. Um, so generally speaking, it's gonna be the habit change where you think you're restricting your energy intake to 1200 calories a day, but when we actually look at it, it's like it's non-compliant. Nobody can comply to that for that period of time. Um, so generally speaking, I've had one or two clients over the years where I'm like, I 100% believe you and I don't know how we're not getting weight loss on this. So you have to bring out all the different tricks for that individual. Um, and I would never say to someone, oh, you're, you're blatantly lying to me. Like genuinely think, you genuinely think that yeah. like if you're putting in the effort to tracking, but when we've looked at that from a behavior perspective, generally it's non-compliance. Um, and there's some tricks that I have to sort of work out whether that's happening or not with someone. Um, so no, there's no difference in energy expenditure or metabolic rate for eating more frequently. It just comes down to like your um, total intake that matters. Okay, so how frustrating is it? Have you ever been told weight loss is simple as just eat a bit less and move a bit more? I hate it. I hear it all the time from GPs when I've got like really overweight clients that are struggling with so much in life. And the GP's just gone on just like, why can't you just walk a bit more and stop eating like, all the time? And I feel like this is like saying to an alcoholic, just stop drinking. Or worse, when we think about our food environment and the obesogenic food environment, it's like putting an alcoholic in a bar saying, just don't drink the wine in front of you. Um, so weight loss is 
really complex. It, it does boil down to that energy equation that we spoke about, like you do need to be in that energy deficit with less coming in than what you're expending, absolutely. But as a dietitian, we're doing our clients a disservice if we're not exploring all of these different factors here. So yes, in the green, the, the food and beverage intake and activity, absolutely, they're fundamental to consider. But how hard is it to eat well after you've had a shitty night's sleep? Who's felt that? Like that's hard. Um, and we know that our appetite is generally greater after poor sleep. So we've got two hormones that control appetite. We've got leptin, which tells our body, oh, you've had enough, you don't need to eat anymore. And we've got ghrelin, which is that hormone that's released when you have like a grumbly stomach. And generally you've got higher ghrelin levels and lower leptin sensitivity after poor night's sleep. Um, and that can be incredibly challenging to eat well when you're in that state. You've then got emotions. Like I think we've all been in a situation where we've eaten according to emotional influence, not based on true physical hunger. Like I know I have. Um, you know, you have a stressful day or you are upset about something and food makes you feel better. Like it's certainly something that I unpack with clients all the time. Um, I think that environment is a big underestimated one. So when we look at studies um, in households where, for example, you've got fruit that's sitting in a fruit bowl on the counter versus fruit that's in the fridge, if your household has got something that's in sight, it's more front of mind and those households consume more fruit. If you think about the fact that easily within most workplaces and houses like where we live, it's a short five minute walk to either a service station to grab food or a grocery store or somewhere that sells food. So it's highly, I guess in our face um, and the the more like aware of it and the more um, present it is in our environment generally the more we consume like we are a product of our environment um, and it makes it really challenging when you've got the food system set up in this country to essentially fail like let us fail at, <laughs> at being healthy um, so unpacking that and like you know I spoke to a client today who was really mindful of like alcohol intake, for example. And she said like, I'm really struggling. I know I shouldn't be drinking those five glasses of wine every night, but like, it's just there, it's nice and cold in the fridge. And I said, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take those wine bottles out of the fridge and they're gonna go down. We're gonna change the environment. And you know what, I'll probably have her back in two weeks. And she's like, yeah, I didn't wanna drink the warm white wine. So I just had <laughs> sparkling water from the fridge instead. Um, so it sounds really simple and obviously there's different issues that I need to unpack with that particular client, but the food environment matters and sometimes having some strategies to support what you're trying to achieve is quite helpful. Um, medications and medical conditions, yes, they matter. Um, and it's yes, something that I would consider. It probably has less of an impact than what a lot of people will be led to believe, but certainly it does have an impact for some. Um, hunger and reward signals, like the seeking of food is a pleasurable endeavor. Like you get a dopamine hit when you're searching for something. Um, so definitely that's gonna work against us in some regard, as well as genetics. They do matter to some extent. So um, yes, you need to be in an energy deficit to lose weight, but I think, you know, unless you're addressing all of these other factors, you're not fostering that long-term sustainable approach and you're back to square one in, you know, after the eight week challenge is finished, for instance. So it's not as simple as eating less and moving more. What about this one? So artificial sweeteners are killing us. Um, who saw this in the headlines back in May? Artificial sweeteners? Yeah. Yeah, it's been doing the rounds. So in May, the World Health Organization released a guideline that said that they were recommending against the use of what we call non-nutritive sweeteners unless you have diabetes. So they were the exempt population. So non-nutritive sweeteners, they're all the artificial sweeteners like the Splendor, Aspartame, etc. cetera. Um, but they also include the naturally occurring sweeteners like your stevia or monk fruit because um, they're non-nutritive. There's no energy content in them. So they're lumped into that category. So I thought that was particularly interesting that they'd recommend against that. And I guess the reasoning was when they pulled a lot of the studies and the evidence together, they found that people who were using both types of sweeteners from a, like wanting weight loss were no more successful in losing weight than those who weren't using artificial or non-nutritive sweeteners. Um, so that was the guideline that was released and there was a lot of media, like this was just on my social media for two months. Yeah, so aspartame now is classified as possibly carcinogenic to humans. 
So let's unpack this. So these are the classifications here. In terms of sweeteners, or aspartame I should say specifically, it's in group 2B there and that's where it sits. But look at what's in group 1. Alcohol. Yes. Who drinks? I mean, class 1 carcinogen. Carcinogenic to humans. We've then got processed meat in the same category. Does that mean that we should never have any alcohol or processed meat? Well, it's definitely carcinogenic when we look at the studies. Look at group 2A, which is probably carcinogenic to humans. You've got red meat and shift work. <laughs> Try saying that to a nurse who's been in the industry for 20 years. It's hard enough to get good nurses that are happy to stay on the job with the conditions that they're under. Well, it's probably carcinogenic. You've then got in the same 2B category, pickled vegetables and aloe vera leaf extract. So we shouldn't have sauerkraut, right? Because it's probably carcinogenic. So. Yes, dose. Yeah, hundred percent. 100%, yeah, yeah. So I think what has, uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So what's gotten lost in this is that dose matters. So aspartame is possibly carcinogenic to humans because we don't have enough human data because it's not ethical to pump aspartame through humans when you think it's potentially carcinogenic. So this is based on animal data and that's not to say that that's completely invalid. We've got enough evidence to suggest that, yeah, it's possibly carcinogenic to humans. But for a 75 kilo adult, that's 17 to 21 cans of diet soft drink a day. Yeah. Oh, look, sometimes, but this has to be chronic as well. Like it's not one day of doing it. It's like, are you doing that for 10 months of a year? Yeah. Like I worked with someone who was on two liters of Pepsi Max a day and a few Red Bulls and I thought, gee, that's like horrendous, but that's still not, that's still not that high. And also dementia. Yeah, and look, yeah. My dad doesn't have 17 to 21, but he does not drink water. So he doesn't drink alcohol, but he could go through a 30 pack of cans of, of Coke yeah. water because he thinks that's better for him. Yeah. Probably one every two days, three days maybe. And yeah, it's definitely, well, he's definitely at that age, but I've said to him, it's, it's that's why yeah. you're starting to forget things. Yeah. And, and look, there are studies out there that suggest there's potential issues there. Um, but at the end of the day, like what I'm sick of hearing as a dietitian is the fear mongering around, I can't just enjoy one can of Coke. And look, I would love clients to give up all artificial sweeteners. Like water is obviously the best beverage that we can have, but is it realistic to take everything else away in total? So I think it's something to be aware of and the message should be like, just be careful with how much you're having because at a, at a certain dose, when we look at carcinogenic um, properties in particular, then it's 17 to 21 and that may be different for different conditions like dementia for instance. So they're not killing us unless you're consuming the dose that is required to have that effect. Um, what about the gluten free? Who's like on gluten free or has done gluten free in the past? Yeah. Um, so I do because I have celiac disease. Um, so I have to, I've got no choice in the matter. And it's a protein that's naturally found in wheat, barley, rye, and different grains. So for someone with celiac disease, like a strict gluten-free diet is the only way to treat that condition. It's an autoimmune condition. And in terms of dose, it's like the most tiny part per million that's gonna co cause issues for someone with that condition. Um, for everyone else, it doesn't necessarily guarantee weight loss. It depends on how it's done and it can be done really well because you can focus on all the naturally occurring gluten-free foods that you know most people don't consume because if you can consume regular bread, who's gonna consume something like buckwheat as a wonderful whole grain? Um, but it can also be done really poorly and isn't always the best nutritious choice. So it can actually sometimes result in weight gain. Let's have a look at this. So I've just got a couple of brands of muesli there. Carmen's has got, I think it's a new product because I've only seen it popping up recently. They do a grain-free granola great nutritious ingredients in there heaps of seeds nuts just no gluten or grains and then you've got morning sun which is just a, a natural muesli based on oats dried fruit nuts in there so if we look at fat content low 
52.5 grams per 100 versus 1.9. But more importantly, like in terms of saturated fat content, yeah, up there, and fiber. So they're both, they're both high fiber choices. I need to say that if something's got 9.8 grams of fiber per 100, it's a high fiber choice, um, but not as high as the regular one. So it, this is just one example of where, you know, someone's trying to do something that is going to be a nutritious choice. They've heard that gluten-free is better and they've gone about it and they just are not making the choice that's consistent with potentially their weight loss goal. Um, so look, it can result in weight loss and it can be a great improvement in diet quality when you experiment with other sort of naturally gluten-free things. But a lot of the time, particularly the packaged foods, it's really hard to find ones that match up in terms of nutritional content. So it's not the best way to lose weight, essentially. And then how are we doing for time? We've probably got some time for questions. I know that that wasn't specifically menopause, perimenopause related, but I'm hoping that there's some of the things that you hear in that space, because um, I know there's a lot of information and misinformation and it's really hard to know what to do. Absolutely. And look at probably there's like a two pronged approach to this because if you're dealing with hot flushes and hormonal fluctuations that make you feel terrible and sleep is difficult, and it's trying to have strategies to help manage that and what you're going through. Um, so even different, I had a client that was showing me different cooling pads that you can purchase for pillows. They're just like an insert that goes in, tries to keep you cool. Having light pajamas, fans on, all that kind of stuff that you're probably aware of and have heard. So I'd definitely be addressing like the sleep quality where you can, um, other strategies that work well, whether you're going through menopause or not, is like a cool, dark environment, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, even if it's a non-work day. So that routine is really important. And like early sunshine, because you want to get sunshine in the back of the eye um, to reset your circadian rhythms. So all of that's important. And then you mentioned, um, you know, like, what do we do when we're feeling like that? Like, we've already had a terrible night's sleep. How do you actually manage it? Well, it depends on you as an individual because there's probably 100 different things that you could do and some are going to be helpful and some aren't. Um, it might be when I'm feeling tired, instead of going for the chocolate and lollies, I'm going to go for a really icy cold beverage to wake me up or I'm gonna go outside and get 10 minutes of fresh air to wake me up. It's having a list of strategies that might be helpful for you as an individual because things are gonna work differently for different people. Does that kind of answer? Yeah. Sure. yeah. They're definitely a hundred percent. Yep, hundred percent. They're two things that I would always cover off on when I'm working with someone who's transitioning through that change in hormones. So when when you go through perimenopause, essentially estrogen is all over the place. So it's going to decline over time. But what we know is it's high some days, low another, which is why symptoms are just an absolute mess. Um, but generally, when you have declining estrogen levels, as you said, our, it's harder for our body to hold on to its lean body mass. So from a, like whether it's a body composition perspective or just a longevity perspective or a strength perspective as we age, um, really, really important from a food perspective to get enough protein spread appropriately across the day. 
Um, and then obviously anything that you do in the gym from a resistance training perspective and Luke will be able to talk to sort of minimum effective dose and what you need to be doing in terms of loading up bones and muscles, um, they work hand in hand. And then the bone loss as well, when we have that decline in estrogen, um, our calcium needs are higher. And that can be easier if you're focusing on protein because dairy products and fortified alternatives generally are higher in protein as well. So it works hand in hand to do both. Um, and I generally, in that age group as well, would normally ask a GP to check vitamin D levels in the blood because it doesn't matter what you're doing from a food perspective. If you don't have enough vitamin D, you're not going to be pulling the calcium into the bones. Um, and if you're not loading them up appropriately with exercise as well, it's, it's useless to some extent. Yeah, so definitely two common issues in that age group that are really important to address. When you said spread protein, yeah. So typical example, someone might have sliced toast with some avocado or Vegemite in the morning for breakfast, really low in protein. They might have, I don't know, a chicken salad for lunch or a chicken salad wrap might be sort of moderately appropriate in terms of amount of protein there. And then you have a 400 gram steak for dinner. So you've got enough protein but it's not spread e evenly across the day. Um, and when we spread it a little bit even, more evenly across the day, our body does a better job of putting that towards muscle building. Um, so it's not even just a, enough to, well, it's better to have adequate protein. And then once someone's got adequate protein intake, when you distribute it or spread it more evenly, it's definitely optimum. So what do you consider adequate, adequate. protein? Um, 20 to 30 grams of high quality protein. So if you're consuming um, meat or dairy or eggs, generally anything that contains 20 to 30 grams of protein. So that's as little yeah. as Good. per meal, Good. sorry, yeah, so per meal. Time. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And generally like three to four hips yeah. is good, yeah. So that would be 200 grams of Chobani yogurt, for instance, or three large eggs in terms of food. Um, from some of the plant-based sources, yeah, 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 three. <laughs> One or two is not enough. Um, and then if, you, if you're consuming more plant-based sources of protein like edamame beans, soybeans, um, legumes, you just need to be a little bit more careful because you need quite a bit more. It can be done and I'll work with clients on that, but yeah, that looks a little bit different in terms of how much you need. So is a protein shake? It counts, like, it counts. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. like once a day is... Well, if, yeah, it, if it's to fortify meals or to help you get enough in, it's a great strategy. I don't want it replacing, you know, everything, but if it's just thrown in there because you, yeah, need that. Yeah, counts. Was there a question? Yeah. 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 Um, the latest study that I've seen, I think it was Heart Foundation that put this out. Um, in Australia, our guidelines are no more than 350 grams of unprocessed red meat in a week. So for some people, that's like one steak. Um, for others, it can be smaller portions across the week. But look, your white meat and your seafood and your non-meat products are fine as well. You just need to be having enough of it. So if you wanted to completely avoid red meat and just focus on the others, that's certainly an acceptable thing to be doing as well. Um, if you think about the fact that when, you're transi when you've transitioned through menopause, you're not losing blood through menstruation every month. So our iron, our iron requirements generally after menopause um, are less than half that of someone who is in reproductive age. Um, and there's still a lot of iron in other sources apart from red meat. Even when you look at some of the legumes, there can be a wonderful amount of iron in them. Uh, and particularly if they're consumed with a source of vitamin C, like some fruit or some capsicum um, in with your spinach salad, you've got great absorption and then avoiding things like tea and coffee out like around meals because they inhibit absorption. So it's about working on how much you're absorbing as well. Yeah. Um, apart from, well, first of all, I think it's good like the, all the minutes like, okay, so you pretty much eat how you want, how you want. Carbs aren't bad, timing doesn't matter to a degree. Um, intermittent fasting, yes or no. Yeah. Um, and then for like this group of ladies, like, and obviously you said protein is a big one, making yeah. sure that's spread across the day. Yeah. Um, outside of that, are there any other strategies uh, for like pre, pre post or, or perimenopause uh, in terms of body composition? 
as a consideration? In terms of improving body yeah, composition? Improving body yeah. Body. I mean, not being too aggressive with your energy deficit, I think, is a big one as well. So working with someone that can talk you through, like, what's a realistic expectation in terms of changes over what period of time and what's too aggressive or detrimental. The proteins, the spread of protein across the day is a big one. Um, and then the other nutrient that I look at just from like a satiety perspective would be fiber. And we often don't think about that, but fiber is really filling and it helps to detoxify and clear ho excess hormones through the gastrointestinal tract anyway. Um, so that's probably the other one that I would throw in, but I think it's just like it's so individual. As I said, I've got clients that are successful with intermittent fasting. I've got clients that are ex really successful gluten-free diets and others that aren't. Like it just, this is where like working with someone on an individual basis is really important to coach you through changes that are sustainable for you. Because there's no one best diet. Like the best diet is the one you can stick to. And that looks different. It looks different for me. It looks different. Yeah. It just sort of sounds like basically there's lots of behavioural waste. 100%. Yeah, so yeah. Like yeah, and not feeling miserable while you're doing it. Like the best thing that I can hear in terms of feedback if I'm working on someone with weight loss or body composition goals is, oh, I've lost five kilos already and I don't even feel like I'm on a diet. Like you send them away with a meal plan and they look at it and they're like, oh, it's not that different to what I'm doing. And they go away and they come back and they're like, it's wonderful. I'm down all this weight and I don't feel like I'm, like you shouldn't feel like you're on a diet because if you're on a diet, you're gonna go off it at some point. What are, um, what are like the most common, okay, maybe the men's, but <laughs> what I should say, like, do you see any real common mistakes for women going through that period in terms of nutrients and how to blank it? Yeah, look, I think it's just, it comes down to that misinformation. So that when they come to see me, they've tried 10 different things and they're absolutely frustrated and it's miserable. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, I tend to be the last stop. <laughs> they've, they've gone and done everything else. They've you know, listen to webinars, they've bought all the books, all the supplements, they've spent a thousand dollars on this like great liver detox system that they found online that's got wonderful testimonials on there. Um, so I think it's that misinformation and just not knowing what to do and when you don't know what to do, you just don't do anything. So I think that's probably a common thing, just not knowing what to do and then, yeah, in addition to those sort of myths that I've gone through. There's too much emphasis on the weight side. 100%. The side. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, and you know, even with, because um, when women going through perimenopause gain weight, it's generally the visceral fat around the middle. And so yes, from like a physical appearance perspective, there's a drive to reduce that or manage that. But even from like a cholesterol level, heart disease risk, blood pressure and what that's doing, um, it's wonderful as well to get that sort of full panel of bloods done because you can see all those positive health changes um, with or without weight loss as well, I've seen. Yep, yep, so let's delve into that. So soy products contain a compound called phytoestrogens. Um, they bind weakly to our estrogen receptors and mimic estrogen in the body. They do not increase your body's production of estrogen. So that's a really important thing or myth, I guess, to dispel. So when you consume tofu, you're not, your body's not producing any more estrogen, but it's just weakly acting on the estrogen receptors to get a similar effect. Um, so that's probably where there's a little bit more evidence around different supplements or different foods that could provide benefit in terms of managing things like hot flushes um, and night sweats with, with menopause symptoms. So does that mean eat it more? Eat it, yeah. Eat better? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 Too much soy you've heard. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've heard about the whole man boobs yeah. having like soy products. No, I've had bodybuilders that have been vegan and yeah, that's no, okay, man boobs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Did you have another question? Yeah. 
Well, see, I think I'm probably biased in answering that because I only see the women that are struggling. Like, I don't see the women that, like, why are they seeing me if menopause is just this wonderful experience? So I see all the negatives of it and I, I can comment on the fact that it's certainly common, but mindset, as with everything, matters and the way you view things is going to change your experience in that process. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we all viewed it as a, you know, beautiful thing because at the end of the day you go through puberty you go through menopause if you're female like you can't avoid it and you can't delay it it's just inevitable and it will happen um but yeah I, I would see the negative just because that's that's who comes to see me yeah we need people to stop saying you need eight hours of sleep <laughs> <laughs> need people to stop saying everyone's yeah, individual yeah. with that i know yeah and some people will thrive on six or seven some people need more like we do have a variation in what's sort of considered normal or optimal for someone as well yeah is there um is there anything outside of like hormone replacement therapy or yeah. whatever that you've seen or to help keep estrogen levels higher um look hormone it's individual, like the soy is probably the one thing that doesn't keep estrogen higher, but it can mimic some of the effects of estrogen in the body. Um, so from natural sources like your tofu or your fermented soy, like your tempeh is quite good, um, and edamame beans. But yeah, look, HRT is certainly an individual conversation that I think women are scared to have with their doctors because we, again, hear about the negatives and we hear about the fact that it causes breast cancer and we're going to be at an increased risk of all these negative outcomes. I know. I know, 100%. But what are we hearing in the media? Yeah, we're not hearing that side of things. Um, yeah, like women are terrified and when you're like, well, what's quality of life mean? And when you look at the amount, like we're not... They don't ever prescribe HRT to replace the full amount of estrogen. They're like, it's, they always want to put you on the smallest amount to control symptoms. This is why they don't, generally doctors wouldn't do blood tests to look at estrogen levels throughout perimenopause, because all over the place, I test you today, it's going to be different to tomorrow. Um, but what they do is definitely monitor symptom management in response to either medication or other changes. And then they would scale the dosage of the HRT according to sort of symptoms. Oh yeah. So look, I've got. I've got a couple of um, well recipe cards that I'll hand out. It's got our details on the bottom, but these are our homemade like rivet ride bars. So if you're an active individual, love going for long bike rides and hiking, these are fantastic like a muesli bar equivalents that you can make, and they freeze really well. Um, so I'll just hand them out. Did you want to keep a few here? Yeah. Yeah? Thanks. Welcome. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so one, two, three, four. I think that's enough. There's a huge thing. Oh. Um, yeah, look, I mean, there's something to be said about if you're down three litres of water, you're not going to be absorbing three litres of water because you don't need three litres anyway. Um, if you add some salt or sodium to water, you like rehydrate better. Is that what hydrolyte is? Hydrolyte's really concentrated in terms of, yeah, both sodium as well as some other electrolytes like potassium. Um, so, yeah, quite a high concentration. Yeah. 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 So Yeah, and I think space. it would just come down to the individual. Yes, yeah. so they're sort of the generic ones. So the calcium needs increase, the protein. I think protein definitely is important at, in reproductive age anyway, um, but even more so because we're so prone to that age-related muscle decline. Um, and then look, you can monitor other things. Like a, some women might experience changes in thyroid levels as they transition through perimenopause as well, but that's just something you monitor with your GP. It's not necessarily something that you should like, can't eat certain things to prevent that. Um, so yeah, they're, gen they're generally like at a group level, the things that I would look at. 
So if I was gonna <laughs> so choose choose your your flavour in terms of whether you're, whether you're even carbs, high carbs, low carbs, yeah. choose your meal frequency, yeah. blah, 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 blah. <laughs> find the way that you have an energy deficit, keeping those other things in, in mind and keep an eye on managing other symptoms. Yeah, and I know it's boring. Like it's boring to have a dietitian go just like, you know, you need an energy deficit, but that's what it boils down to. It's just how you create that that would look different for each individual. So how do you work that out? Yeah, um, look, there are general calculators that you can use online to get a, a rough estimate. At the end of the day, I would just use whatever my best sort of clinical estimate would be, um, and then you adjust up or down from that. So it comes down to monitoring, like you might have three different online calculators that give you roughly similar energy content ranging from, I don't know, like 6,000 to 7,500 kilojoules. Pick one of them, stick to it for a couple of weeks, monitor how you're feeling and then any changes that you're looking to achieve in terms of body composition or weight, scale it up or scale it down. So you do it for a couple of weeks and then... Yeah, I would give yourself at least like two weeks because you're going to have normal fluctuations on the scale from day to day anyway. Um, and a couple of weeks would give you time to sort of monitor measurements as well from a body composition perspective. Do you find macros you still Oh, look, it depends on the person. Um, I'm not a massive fan of it because I think there's, you can make them work by having shit food in there. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's great because you have that flexibility and if I want chocolate, I can have it, I just make it fit. But at the end of the day, like learning how to eat properly for you and incorporate some of those things from time to time without having to sort of track macros all the time is probably the way that I work with a lot of clients. Um, so look, I'll get asked for them sometimes and I'll, you know, if that's what a client wants, I'll give them my best educated estimate and then we as I said, adjust up or down. Um, but like as we've seen with protein distribution matters, well, if you're supposed to have 90 grams a day and you have it all at dinner, like you're technically fitting it into your macros, but it's not exactly optimized. No, so normally I would calculate someone's, so the total kilojoule value is the best predictor of weight changes, so energy budget. Then I would make sure someone's consuming enough protein spread it across the day, and then their preference for fat or carbohydrates is very individualized. You also talked about fiber before. Yep. So I've heard conventional wisdom is you should try to get 25 grams a day. For women, yep, For women, yep. at minimum. Uh, Um, yeah, fruit, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds. And how do you supplement? I'm good. Sorry, sorry. How does 25 grams of fiber translate into actual food? Yeah, yeah. What does that mean? Oh, look, a pe look, it depends. It depends on the type of fruit or vegetable. Generally, a serving of fruit or veg has got anywhere between, like, you know, lettuce has got barely anything, but something like carrots probably got three or four grams per half cup. For instance, same with like a medium piece of fruit. Berries have got a lot more. A slice of wholemeal bread has got about four grams of fibre per slice. I could just, yeah, I can give you a list of things, but it's, it's an achievable target. You don't have to go too far out of your way. Um, if you're eating minimally processed foods, it's not difficult to do. Yeah. And during this phase that we're all in, does mm -hmm. it change then what we're doing here with food? What we should exercise wise well, no, food wise around gym food. sessions <laughs> well yeah look it depends on the type duration and intensity of the session for sessions that are higher intensity or longer duration